you're listening to Text Me When You Get Home, a comedy podcast that discusses all things true crime and creepy. We tell you stories about murder, alien abductions, paranormal events and other spooky and macabre stuff. I'm Sophie. I'm Craig. And I'm Sean. Please remember to follow and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you usually listen. We'd really appreciate it, but only if they're nice. If you've got something nasty to say, then keep it to yourself, please. (laughs) If you watch us on YouTube or Twitch, then please follow us, like this video, all the other stuff that people tell you to do. Do it here and all, please. Uh, Just FYI. We also release extra mini episodes on all the audio channels called Extra Ghoulies. So if you do watch us on Twitch and YouTube and you haven't heard of those, go over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and have a listen to them and all. So. There's an exciting story about pigeons coming your way. So, you know, you know, race for that. Race for that. You're never going to be ready for that story. (laughs) I certainly wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) It was a good story. I liked it. I liked it. It, Like I said on the podcast, it it. was a story. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So time to get on with today's episode from Craig. What are you telling us about today, please? So this week, I want you to strap yourselves in because this one's a gripper. Gripper? A a gripper. (laughs) So... (laughs) Today, I'm going to be telling you about parasite, dismemberment, and cam- cannibalism in Annabelle. Am- 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 <laughs> I'll start that again. Today, I'm going to be telling you about parasite. No, 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 no wait, Sean, don't, don't you be taking a timestamp. We leave okay. that in. Okay, we, we leave the mistakes in. We, yeah, we've, why, why we've do we tr- leave my mistakes in, but we take all of yours out? I was just about to explain why we leave yours in. <laughs> because. I'm going to like, me and you were bullies, Craig, right? (laughs) And last week, Sean mentioned that we were picking him up on all of his mistakes, right? So now let's pick. I'm going to take Joy, (laughs) like I didn't join in last week, and pick you up on yours. So please continue. Leave it in. Thank you. Okay. So today I'm going to be telling you about parasite, dismemberment, and cannibalism Mm. in Aberdeen, New South Wales. Catherine Mary Knight was an abattoir worker who stabbed her husband 30 t- 37 times before skinning him so precisely and perfectly that when police f- first saw his skin hanging over the door to the lounge with a meat hook, they thought he was a curtain. Oh, so a nice light-hearted one today then, eh? Uh... Yep. A so... nice Craig <laughs> special. Yeah, definitely. I'd say mine was pretty grim last week, so, you know. It was Equally as horrible, yeah. 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 So, Catherine... Oh, another another one of the police actually distri- <laughs> described it as what he thought was a wetsuit, which is even worse, uh, isn't it? <clears throat> like a flesh-coloured wetsuit. Yeah. Which is, if I was going to get a wetsuit, it would be a flesh-coloured <laughs> wetsuit. I would get a flesh-coloured one, but with, like, speckled brown bits on it, just so people thought it was body hair. <laughs> or, or just, like, hairy sunspots. Chest. <laughs> no, I'd want like hairy chest, oh, hairy ass like, crack. I thought you meant like Monty Burns. <laughs> just, just like yeah. Little so, <clears throat> Catherine isn't the only person to eat their murder victim. Their murder victims. There's loads of deviants before her. So let's before we literally last week, <laughs> last yep, week before we before we get into Catherine, let's have a quick rundown of a few. Uh, so what you're yes, saying is we'll I said start, get into so. Catherine, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so in, in Wisconsin in 1957, after having sex with, a de- with decomposing cavities and skinning them, Ed Gein would eat the body parts. He'd also make nice lampshades, nice lampshades, soap dishes and tasteful face masks. So are you saying that he's got an Etsy shop? Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in Philadelphia in 1986, 42-year-old army pensioner Gary Heidnick kidnapped women and kept them chained in his cellar as sex slaves, eventually murdering some of them and eating their remains. When police arrived, they found four young women who'd been repeatedly tortured, raped and beaten, chained together in a dungeon with a young woman's head in a pot in the kitchen and human ribs in a roasting dish. Jesus. And this is just the amuse-bouche at the minute. This is just us getting a a little bit of a start and already feel grim already. You need a shower. I'm not finished. (laughs) <laughs> he did tell you. He did. He did tell you to strap in, Sean. So. He did. He did. Sorry. Said it was going to be a gripper. 
Uh, so, so in 1570, we all know our friend Peter Stubb roamed the German countryside faith, faithfully aided and abetted by his mistress and daughter in search of young women to shred, to tear to shreds to satisfy his bloodlust for human flesh. Just supposedly. After, supposedly. <laughs> just after World War I, the werewolf of Hanover, Fritz Harman, delighted in killing his victims by biting through their throats while raping them and gorging on the meat and blood. All at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, multitasking of these people is almost to be respected. Albert Fish, abducted, molested, tortured, castrated and and ate at least 16 children in New York and all over the US between 1928 and 1934. Are you paying attention? Because there is a a point to this. Over a 21 period between 1955 and 1976, Joaquin Kroll murdered, mutilated and had sex with the corpses of at least 14 young women and children throughout Germany. After he'd had his way with their bodies, he'd cook them up and eat them. The younger, the better. Yeah. 56-year-old Andre Chikatilo, a school teacher who, in a 24-year killing career in Russia, saw the horrific deaths and cannibalization of 53 victims, mainly children, and was by far the most prolific. Like Kroll, Chikatilo was a necrophiliac in that his victims had to be dead before he could have sex with them. And finally, from 1988 to 1991... Jeffrey Dahmer, a 20-year-old, 28-year-old chocolate factory worker, slaughtered 17 young men, raped and mutilated their courses, then cut them up and ate their body parts. Their courses? <clears throat> yeah, so the things that, that women would wear in like the olden days to keep them <laughs> Corsets. Eat their corsets, yeah. Well, what else are you going to do with them? I don't, I don't, yeah, don't know. 100% correct. If, you, if they're not your size, you got to eat them. <laughs> Can't take them back. Can't take them back. So, Australia's Catherine Mary Knight has deservedly earned her place on this depraved roll call of humanity, but can you tell what the major difference is between these and Catherine Knight? Uh, She's a woman. Exactly. Most of the people who do this kind of hideous crime have penises. Uh, (laughs) This is why it makes Catherine Knight a perfect episode for me. (laughs) Yeah. A crazed female killer of men. We do love a feminist. Do and boy or oh boy was she a crazy bitch. <laughs> um, so until the first of March two thousand, Sleepy Aberdeen, situated on the New England Highway, two hundred and sixty six kilometers northwest of Sydney, population one thousand seven hundred and fifty, was best known as the birthplace birthplace of the Blue Heeler cattle dog. Um, so pretty, a pretty uneventful place. Pre- yeah, uh, the way you phrased that, I, I had a very visual image of just like driving through this like sun baked place with just the sign, it's all all manky sign and the, the population numbers mm-hmm. there. So, yeah. yeah, seventeen, it's just it's like scribbled there. out, seven hundred and fifty one. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. yeah. mean it's just like because Catherine Knight's been there, it's just crossed out and just put zero. <laughs> it's um, it's just generally not not a lot happens there. But not anymore. These days, Aberdeen is known as the home of Catherine Knight, arguably the most depraved monster in Australia's grisly, homicidal history. I must admit, lately, I've done a few in Australia. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, they just are. seem to have an edge on the... Or just on the depravity. Yeah. You do Good for you, Australia. Yeah. Well done, Australia. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. Gold medal. Gold medal. <laughs> Uh, so visitors to Aberdeen are now far more interested in ogling the single-storey three-bedroom bungalow at number 84 Andrew Street, where a murder and other unspeakable acts took place, and pondering what, pondering what would cause the middle-aged housewife, mother and grandmother to perpetuate such evil. Um, so my sources this week draw heavily from Murderpedia, of course they do, Wikipedia, and also... Um, uh, thing that I watched on <laughs> on uh, Prime Video and I can't remember what it's called. So the collective we will tell you there. Will we? Will we? Yeah. The collective will we? we will. You might not, but the collective we will. No, I'm not. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ch- start with Catherine's childhood. Um, so Barbara Rowan was a prominent person in the community. She was the wife. Uh, she was wife to the owner of the local abattoir, which was the lifeblood of the local town. Pretty much everyone that lived there worked at what the abattoir. The abattoir? Uh, that, so they, they had two jobs, coal miner and coals, coal and cattle were pretty much the only jobs. Right, okay. Cattles, coal and cattle even. Um, 
So Barbara Rowan was the wife of the abattoir owner, um, and the town viewed her running off with one of the abattoir workers as a scandalous affair. She ran Absolute off. Absolute scandal. Absolute scandal. Scandal. Um, she ran off with a man called Ken Knight. There we go. I was wondering who this woman was. <laughs> yeah. So Catherine Mary Knight was a tw- was a twin with a, was born with her sister, a twin sister Joy, at Tenterfield Hospital in New South Wales on October twenty fourth, nineteen fifty five. Her mother, formerly Barbara Rowan, already had four boys: Patrick, Martin, Neville, and Barry, by her previous marriage, and another son, Charlie, with Catherine's father, Ken. Another son, Shane, would follow in nineteen sixty one. So quite a big blended fam- family um, but none of them lived together when Barbara's previous marriage broke up the two older boys Patrick and Martin stayed with her dad Jack Rowan and the two younger lads Neville and Barry went to live with their aunt in Sydney Neville and Barry in my opinion have the strongest names of the family <laughs> me too <don't. laughs> I'm, I'm still thinking them as like an Australian uh, Chuckle Brothers <laughs> yeah 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 Neville to me very strong name. <laughs> <laughs> to you <laughs> Uh, when Jack Rowan died in 1959, Patrick and Martin went to live with their mother as well. Eight children now? Seven uh, children. Seven. seven. Uh, so Ken Knight was an abattoir slaughter man who travelled with his family throughout Queensland and New South Wales, applying his back-breaking trade in 12-hour shifts at Wollongara, Godenna, Tenterfield and Moray. <laughs> And where... I like how you, you go in and out of Aussie to, to <laughs> Geordie. Oh, right. Wh- well, which bit was Geordie? I can't say it again. Say, say this. Was it was it Tenterfield? <laughs> it might have been, yeah. Wollongara. Wollongara. Gunnedda. Gunnedda. I can't remember that. Uh, it's Tenterfield. Yeah, it is. Tenterfield. <laughs> how would you say it? Tenterfield. Uh, Tenterfield. Ten. Tenterfield. Tenterfield. <laughs> so yeah, he used to travel around uh, applying his trade. Um, they were really hard people, hard working class people, and it was said that there may have been some domestic violence in the house towards the children from the mother, Barbara, and from Ken towards Barbara. So yeah. Nasty cycle then. Yeah, uh, it was also said that Ken was sexually violent towards Barbara and would regularly have sex with his wife in front of the children. Ew! Mm. Catherine mm. would often claim rape throughout her childhood and was known to have violent behaviour. So it was never proven that she was ever raped, but there was definitely nefarious sexual activity in the household. I believe that she was. Um, I feel like... And a, a young <clears throat> a young kid doesn't know to like make claims like that, do they? You don't know Catherine Knight yet. Um a twin sister uh, Joy has never has never said anything of the I know, life. but it doesn't I doesn't mean anything and I do know I have heard the story before. Yeah. But wait till I we believe. get a bit more detail. You might you might change your mind. She can know. still be a dickhead. I believe she's a dickhead. Yeah, look at, um Oh, Earl Nel- is it Earl Nelson? He had a bit of a sh- he had quite a shitty upbringing. We, we Which felt one somebody- was was the he the gorilla, gorilla killer? killer yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he was brought up in very um, tough circumstances. You can, you're allowed to feel sympathy them before the crimes, the horrible crimes they commit. Yeah, they always are actually, aren't they? Like most of them. That's yeah. why you've got to be nice to kids. Yeah, because they might kill you. <laughs> That that's the only reason. The only reason. Self preservation is nothing yeah, else. It, it's it's not nice in it for me. Let me just write that down. Be nice <laughs> to my children. Okay. I'm like, Dad, why are you acting <laughs> weird? <laughs> I've been told to be nice, otherwise you'll kill me. <laughs> Hi, sons. How are you? <laughs> They're like, uh, Mummy, who is this strange man? <laughs> 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 He's not the one that we went to the museum with the other day, <laughs> wherever it was your wife got taken to with a a man that's not you. <laughs> Listen day. to the extra ghouly, you'll you'll be able to understand what we're talking about. Um, so Catherine and her twin sister Joy were close, but they were said to often fight so violently that they ended up bloody and battered as they punched each other half to death. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. <laughs> so one of the... Uh, in the documentary I watched, one of the local neighbours were like, 
he was a postman and he said, you know, he was like, girls fight when they're, when they're growing up and, you know, they might pull each other's hair. He says, these two were squared up, hands up like boxers, punching hell out of each other in the yard. <laughs> wow. So, At what age was that? Uh, I think he said about six or seven at the time. So they so were they like, Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. So they must have either seen a parent's fight or they'd been trained. <laughs> we're trained to fight each other. <laughs> no, but just trained to defend themselves. Otherwise, you know, I, when I was when I got into fights as a kid, it was all flailing punches. You wouldn't think of you know, putting. <laughs> you know, I can imagine Sean just windmilling and, 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 and screaming <laughs> and crying at the same time. I can imagine him doing that now. <laughs> That's how I get what I want. <laughs> Isn't windmilling something else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's one of those terms that the context is key. The context. Is key. <laughs> I'm very happy that we can just see Craig's top half right now. <laughs> um, so, Ken and Barbara and their six children eventually settled in Aberdeen in 1969, where there was steady work at the local abattoir. Uh, Catherine's only official brush with with retribution was as a 13 year old when she appeared before a children's court in a minor charge and she received a good behavior bond so she wasn't she wasn't ever in any trouble as a child um good behavior bond is a that good a, behavior you, bond i think you promised like, to be good it's yeah he said like a get out of jail free card i think it's your first i for promise your, not to do it again Mr. it's your first <laughs> offense thing right okay uh, so given her lifelong environment, it's hardly surprising that all Catherine Knight wanted to do when she grew up was work in the abattoir. In every watch, a Dis- watch a Disney film and just raise your standards a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Any Disney film will do. <laughs> in every town she'd ever worked, there was a meatworks, and to her, the coppery waft of the slaughterhouse was like an intoxicating perfume. Uh, I love- those are my words. Did you like them? <laughs> coppery waft. Yeah. Um, at 16, she joined her father, twin sister Joy, and brother Charlie, burning out carcasses at the Aberdeen, at the Aberdeen Abattoir. Uh, she first what got... A a, I know. She worked in the offal room first, then later as a borner. <laughs> Where's she? <laughs> <in> a... <laughs> Both those jobs sound horrendous. <laughs> Do I she... need to correct you at this point? Sex worker, <laughs> not a borner. <laughs> no. She was a borner where she and her colleagues would born 60, 600 cattle a day. <laughs> Can you imagine putting it like getting married as like dad's occupation? Well, he's a borner. <laughs> borner. All I remember when I was at uni, I worked in a coffee shop. And the uh, <laughs> Sean's face. You know when you had to bone a bunch of cattle at uni. And Sean. what I did, what I did I in the interview. I must have been off that day. <laughs> when I, uh, the worst job ever to me was cleaning. This is why when I was like super hungover on a Saturday morning, they would make me clean the food bins out. But when you got to like the bottom of the food bin, there'd be like mouldy tea bags at the bottom yeah. and like that the would like mix in the bread. And that used to make me bulk my guts up now that to me is like the worst job ever and now you're telling me that she was a boner oh she got like, promoted to boner that's a, yeah, that is the worst just, she was in the, she was in the awful room first so but, like me and my delicate stomach balking at a moldy tea bag <laughs> yeah. i don't think it would have lasted I've, long in the awful room let's be honest. i think i've got some life lessons to learn just yeah. yet it's just the fact that you said that she she always dreamed of working in an abattoir i'm just seeing uh, this like this disney musical of her life it's <laughs> hilarious and horrifying in the scene <laughs> ah, <laughs> slashing ah. at the meat yeah <laughs> so in the predominantly male domain Catherine became as tough as the best of them i mean given the fact that she used to full-on fist fight with her sister as a child i'm not surprised yeah. and she gave as much as she got in the boning floor jargon that would make a politician blush uh, she was absolutely in her element on the boning floor <laughs> um, i'm not going to stop giggling on that no matter how <laughs> no, no, no. and it was at this first abattoir where she got given a set of knives for her own knives that would become her prized possession some of the other like every little girl dreams (laughs) (laughs) some of the other workers used to talk about um the way that the the very manner that Catherine would work she used to nick arteries just to see the animals bleed and she took malevolent pleasure in death 
she was so she's she's got a formal training in the animal um what's the term that classic trope animal cruelty <laughs> <animal killing>. <laughs> 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 It's the way he's yeah. clicking as well. <laughs> I just can't think of the right word. Like yeah. the, are you talking about the triad of the um, psychopath? Yeah, where they like hurt animals, harm animals, burn things, set shit fire, the bed. piss the yeah. bed in it, <laughs> shit the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's got a formal training in in that, yeah. so it's almost like the animal desecration, animal killing, hurting. It's being. Um, it's Sorry, I've got a frog in okay, my throat. You okay, Sean? You sound I've got, like... I've got a frog in my throat and I'm trying to talk past Kill it! <laughs> Cut it! <laughs> <laughs> Nick it tartary, as Catherine would say. Uh, Catherine was also renowned for not backing down from a con confrontation and with her knife in hand, she challenged anyone who offended her with armed combat. Oh, could you be fucked Fucking with her? Uh, yeah. Imagine like, oh, Catherine, I was actually waiting for the coffee machine. <laughs> you fucking what? <laughs> right, stick them up. <laughs> Did you to fuck off? People, oh, no, people... I, fuck, I, want a, I want a coffee. I want a... <laughs> do people say stick them up in arguments anymore? <laughs> what do they do in Australia? Yeah. <laughs> stick them up. <laughs> Call this a knife. Well, I, I was going to do some impressions, but I absolutely nominate Sophie to do the impressions of Catherine Knight throughout the rest of this. Yeah. Oh, but my uh, my accents my accents are very touch and go. I will give it a go, but don't expect them to be good. You give it a go. I'll give yeah. it a go. Don't you worry, worry. <laughs> See, <laughs> that was a bit Yorkshire. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Catherine Knight, come out me ass. <laughs> Stick him up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously, nobody ever took Catherine on. Catherine's proudest possession was her set of razor sharp boning knives, which she kept in pride of place above her bed. So, <laughs> so she could. <laughs> My boning knives. They get her in the mood for burning, if you know what I mean. <laughs> she used to keep them there so she could have one last long look at them before nodding off to sleep. No doubt to dream about killing animals and carving up their remains. This is helping this musical idea in my head, <laughs> not one jot. This is fantastic musical poetry. Just so yeah, you can that. imagine her like uh, Snow White singing to the animals and then just getting her knives out. <laughs> step, bone, step, step. A bone in knives. Yeah. I fucking bone you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously, uh, so when I tell you about the gory details of what she did, I'm trying to give you a bit of a picture. And the fact that she kept the knives above her bed as ornaments will be particularly disturbing when I get into the details. So her first love or infatuation was with a man called uh, David Kellett, better known as Shorty Kellett, because he was a full foot shorter than her. Oh, wow. uh, and she fell in love with him in 1973. He was 22. She was 18. And she moved in with him. How tall is she, sorry? She's quite tall. So she was a tall woman and a full head taller than Shorty. Right, okay. Um, Kellett was a wild drinking young man and the two found a mutual love of sex, with Shorty being Catherine's first, first proper sexual partner. In uh, 1974, they were married and Catherine had such an insatiable sexual appetite that there was a rumour in locally that Catherine attempted to strangle her husband on the wedding night because he could he wouldn't re repeatedly make love to her because he'd run out of steam so, so Shorty was woken up with Catherine straddling him trying to choke him to death because they hadn't had sex five times Catherine citing the fact that her parents had sex five times on their uh. wedding night and that's what true oh. love is so I David, want to make love just like my mummy and daddy, please. Yeah, <laughs> Call <because> me Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> so because David could only manage flee, to twice. Flee, flee again. <laughs> <laughs> because he could only manage twice, um, she obviously didn't love hit her as much as daddy loved mummy. Uh... <laughs> um, later in the marriage, Kellett worked at the abattoir with Catherine and he was in charge of killing the pigs. From time to time, she would drop in and watch him work, dispatching the animals with a stun gun. It might have been a turn on for her because she took such a, a sadistic pleasure from death. Is this like the Diet Coke at advert back in the day? With, uh, <laughs> just... And I just want to make love. <laughs> and he's there Zap. just kicking, smacking the shit out of these pigs. 
<laughs> no, he, did, like he did it with a stun gun, to be fair. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So he was sat there just like, and she sat there like flicking a bean. Uh, <laughs> yeah, shorty. You can imagine yeah, it, like... shorty. Fucking kill it, shorty. <laughs> uh, like a, a sexy <laughs> outfit. You know, where like water splashing all over the sexy lady, except it's pig's blood in this in this advert for her. Yeah. Um, Oh, Sean, you've muted yourself. It's great material for this musical we're talking about. So, you know, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so Davy Shorty Kellett's family really liked Kathy, as they'd call her, and said she'd be so happy that she'd hum with happiness. Um, but she also suffered massively wild mood swings and was said to possess incredible strength when she flew off the handle. Enough strength to, short, to throw Shorty Kellett across the room. Oh, oh so poor shorty. <laughs> I know. It just paints a picture. When you see the picture of them together as well, he just looks like a little, just a little soft man. <laughs> she's like, oh. she's every picture I've seen of her, she looks wild. Like do Eileen like, Vernos wild. Do you reckon that's part of the attraction for her, someone she can intimidate? The attraction? Oh, so uh, the attraction for her is she's definitely a nymphomaniac and it's control as well. It's definitely control. Right. The attraction. Which one? Which for, one's a nymph a maniac? Is that the one that's just horny all the time? Yeah, she loves. Yeah, yeah. and um, I think that's the attraction of her to most of the men that she she sees throughout her life because apparently she was dynamite in bed as one of the other men described her. Um. So, but massively violent, and as I said, she used to throw him across the room. Um. Shortly after their first child, Melissa Ann was born in nineteen seventy in May of nineteen seventy six. Kellett, who was also a serial womanizer who was unable to cope with his wife's possessiveness and violent moody behaviour, took off with another woman. This was after at, this was just after Kathy tried to stab him with a broken beer ball. Christ. <laughs> Deeply depressed and revengeful at her spouse's departure and with no one to take her grievance, grievances out on, Catherine Kellett chose the closest thing to her. One day after uh, shortly after David had left, she walked down to the local train lines and left two-month-old Melissa in the middle Shit. of the tracks to be run, <gasps> over, run over by the next train that came along. Mm. Fortunately, the infant was rescued because the woman from the corner shop over the road was watching Catherine after reports locally of her walking through town looking disheveled and swinging the pram violently from side to side. Is that Could that be put down to um, post-nate? Uh... That's exactly what it's put down to, Sean. Um, so later the same day Catherine took an axe from a nearby yard and swinging it wildly about her head threatened random threatened to kill several random people including an old man she was apprehended by police and taken to St Elmo's hospital in Tamworth where she was diagnosed with postnatal depression and she checked herself out Christ so yeah um, less than 24 hours later Catherine went to a neighbour's house and said that her baby was ill and that they needed to help the woman and her teenage daughter and son drove around to pick Catherine and the baby up. The teenage daughter went in the house and instead of picking the baby up from the cot, Catherine chased the girl around the house before slashing her face with a butcher's knife. She then took the family hostage in the car while demanding that she, she that the mother take her to David Kellett's mother's house because she wanted to kill David's mother as revenge for him leaving her. Uh, bleeding profusely, the teenage daughter only escaped when her mother pulled into a petrol station after the mother convinced uh, Catherine that the young girl's youngest younger brother, who was also in the car, was asthmatic and should be dropped off somewhere safe while they went on to uh, David Kellett's mother's house. The boy immediately alerted the police. And the police arrived to find a frantic uh, to find a frantic petrol station owner with Catherine wield, wielding a metal rod and threatening to kill everyone. Like Jesus. Was uh, this in the same day, sorry, as her leaving a baby on the... This no. is the day after. Oh, wow, rampage. It took several police officers and the attendant to subdue her by attacking Catherine with a couple of brooms that were handy. Which <laughs> is just them, like, fucking prod her with a broom. Uh, she sounds like some sort of, like... Um, you know, like some, some, something from Marvel, you know, like that's taken some sort of, like, superhuman... Yeah. Incredible Hulk. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's. Is, is, is there any? You no, know, it sounds like bipolar. Is from the limited I understand of bipolar. Just have these manic, 
kind uh, of episodes I, as I well. I think she's but... just a pure psychopath. And it's right. the fact that he left her that... Right, if anyone's going to do the lead, it's going to yeah. be me. Uh, on the recommendation of a local doctor, she was admitted to Morissette uh, Psychiatric Hospital for treatment and detained under supervision while her baby daughter was placed in the care of her grandparents, Barbara and Ken Knight. Catherine was prone to flights of rage, but she's also coldly calculating. It was said that she was amused by the fear that she caused in others, and she used violence and fear to get exactly what she wanted. Um, police at the time notified David Kellett, who was working as a truck driver in Queensland, that his wife was locked in a psychiatric ward under heavy sedation in the most, most notorious mental institution in New South Wales. At the time, things weren't going so well for Kellett, and his now uh, for Kellett and his now pregnant girlfriend in Queensland, and so with. His mother, Jean Kellett, drove the hundreds of kilometres to be with his troubled wife, who who apparently perked up the minute she saw him. I'm all right, really. I'm all right. <laughs> Is that your Australian accent? No. <laughs> and to an Australian accent. Um, on the 9th of August, 1976, Catherine was released into the care of her mother-in-law on the condition that Jean... Uh, see to it that she take her medication. This is the mother-in-law that she was. Tr- yeah, she was going to kill. By the way, fuck's sake! <laughs> so her mother's still alive. Got her baby, but yeah. you're going to release her to the mother-in-law. Pay- the, the mother-in-law who she's threatened to kill. Yeah, as a vengeance killing. She doesn't need to kill him now. David's back, isn't he? She's got a little shorty back. Um. So they collected little Melissa along the way, and within a couple of weeks, Catherine and David were back living together in a rented bungalow in Woodridge in Queensland, where David drove drove trucks and Catherine took a job born in at the Dinmore Meatworks <laughs> um, in Ipswich near Brisbane. So the, the previous the woman he ran off with, who's now pregnant. That's it, yeah. Shout out the picture. Um, they're back together. She's back born in, doing what she loves. He's driving trucks. Um, what, what bo- boning a boning a husband and boning the cat uh, boning the cattle is that yeah. like? two favourite things just like boning <laughs> like boning boning <laughs> <laughs> the reunion turned out to be stormier than ever with Catherine regularly flying into violent rages over nothing in particular assaulting her husband with fists kitchen appliances and anything else that she could lay her hands on in Queensland Catherine's love of her work knives became obsessive she started taking them everywhere she went, and this is and this is when she started hanging them by the bed. When she was asked by David's mother why she hangs them by the bed, she said, they're there in case I need them. <laughs> Fucking hell. Sandy. When, I was, when I was at uni, um, we lived with a, a, a girl that was perhaps on the ditzier side and... Um, left the front door unlocked on a few occasions or whatever so my my best friend uh thought you know what like we're in Middlesbrough it's not the safest place I need to have something to protect myself but we were uni students so we didn't have a lot of options but for some reason we had a cheese knife (laughs) so she used to sleep with a cheese knife under her pillow (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> so she's like Catherine in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I hope she listens to this episode. Yeah, she'd be she like, does listen sometimes. She'd be like, "That's me. That's me." <laughs> <laughs> I slept with the cheese knife. I'm cheesy Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> Beth, cheesy Beth. <laughs> Hi, there cheesy we go. Beth. So we, there you go. I've got a name now. <laughs> Um, you said was, we, Beth. Beth is the one Craig that you said looks like me, but like she goes outside. <laughs> oh yeah, she looks like you with melanin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like she's so it is, is Beth a mix whatever. between Catherine Knight and Sophie Sophie Harbell. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, uh, she's, she's pro- pro- probably probably less less violent than Sophie Harbell. Oh no, she's very violent, is Beth? <laughs> oh, is she cool. <laughs> yeah, but still less violent than you. <laughs> Um, Sandy, uh, Sandy Keller, uh, Kellett, David, David Kellett's sister recalls an incident from that she witnessed, um, that she said she'll never forget. She heard one of the children cl- crying very loudly in the bathroom, uh, when she was staying with, um, Catherine and David, and she went in to find out why it was there. She was confronted by Catherine, just holding her daughter under the hot tap. How old the daughter now? Sorry. Still seemed like two, three months old. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. She, I, I, doesn't recall the sort of times. Right, okay. 
But Sandy told David about the incident and David said to her, Sandy, you need to promise me that you will not confront her about this because she will kill you in your sleep and then she'll probably kill me too. So, so fucking terrifying, isn't it? Um, by 1979, the couple's relationship was in real to trouble and David found Catherine in bed with another man. She begged him for one more chance and David by this point was terrified by his wife's rage and scared for his life, never knowing when she'd attack him one last time. Fucking hell. It's, it, the relationship sounds a bit like um, the one you talked about last time, Craig, with um, Chris and... Yeah. The, what's his name? The, you know, it's just like... But instead of... <laughs> the other Australians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Instead of love keeping him um, uh, pliable, it's genuine fear it's, it's fear little... and sex because apparently what she would do is she'd be horrible really violent then she'd be she'd turn on the absolute charm and she'd keep that she'd be like the perfect housewife right. the house would be spotless and she'd be like an angel in the kitchen and a devil in the bedroom it right, sounds okay. like um any sort of abusive relationship though doesn't it like if you like typically obviously we hear about men being abusive to women they'll do something abusive and then they'll be nice as pie or whatever yeah. the saying is so, so lovely mm -hmm. so lovely to them for a certain period of time convince them no i'm not going to do that again yeah. and then just go into the same old cycle is so that just... considered uh, is it gaslighting is that is that what a kind of gaslighting or is gaslighting just simply say is gaslighting, simply gaslighting saying, when I you ne never said that <laughs> yeah, or, like, it's like um, or making them feel silly, like you're like it's all in their that, head. That, that yeah. didn't happen. You make yeah. it yeah. Like, so. yeah, me. How could I beat you up? Come on. Yeah, I bet she did because she was yeah. like, "Oh, I'm a woman, I can't yeah. do that." Well, I don't think she did, considering she's offering men out for a fight with a knife <laughs> in the, on the boarding floor. I bet she was more like, "Yeah, I'll fucking cut you." <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, one night, she he was late home from the pub, having made the finals in the darts competition. Yay. Well done. Congratulations, mate. Congrats. Uh, Catherine hated him being late and showed him this hatred by hiding behind the, the door then caving in the back of his skull with a skillet. Oh. She hit him once so hard that she fractured his skull before calmly walking away. David managed to get himself off the floor and wander around to his neighbours who called an ambulance. Shit. David spent the next week in hospital with a, with a fractured skull before being discharged. When he got home, he found the remnants of the rest of the evening that Catherine was stewing while he was at, he was late at the pub. She'd taken everything he owned and put it in the bathtub, every last piece of clothing, before chopping it up and setting it alight with a match. She'd burned everything he had, so all he was left with was the bloody clothes that he had on his back that he went to hospital with. Because he came home late after winning at the darts? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he won, he just made it to the final. Did um did she know that what he was doing, or did she like get in her head that he was having an affair or something? I don't know. I mean, he was known. He was a womanizer, but um, I mean, well, she's, she she she's, she's also seen, had an seen affair. fellas as well. Yeah. Then she probably in her headset, in the mindset, she's allowed to. Oh, he deserved it. Yeah. Uh, he he's not allowed to, so he's breaking the rules. Oh. So the police put pressure on at the time for him because the seriousness, the seriousness of the assault, uh, they put pressure on Kellett to um, press charges. But she'd had a week to calm down and she turned on the charm again and she managed to convince him not to do it for her, him and the kids. So you can he, just see it steadily rising, can't you? Yeah, so he didn't. Astonishingly, on March the 6th, 1980, David and Catherine had another daughter, Natasha Marie. David's job as a truck driver put more pressure on the relationship, with Catherine not trusting him while he was away for days at a time. One night, David was awoken to Catherine once again straddling him with a knife to his, a thro with, to his throat, telling him that he had a girl in every town. So uh, he managed to settle her down and they went back to sleep. Could you imagine trying to go back to sleep after that, waking up with your partner, like straddling you with a knife to your throat? Be like no, no. It's like when you have a dream about them having an affair. <laughs> <laughs> We've discussed this before. My dreams are always me having an affair. <laughs> I'm like, sorry, Joe. Like again. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, so this was 1980. They'd, they'd had the the second daughter, and then 
One day in 1984, as if in answer to all of David Kellett's prayers, she was gone. He came home one night from work and the house was spare. Catherine had packed up her two daughters and everything that wasn't nailed down and moved back to live with her parents on their farm outside of Aberdeen. I bet he's like, fuck Sorry, yeah. did, he, did he win at the darts? You didn't say that? <laughs> no, no, he just got to the final. So he, 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 was, he wasn't able to do the match. Oh, poor guy. That's yeah. heartbreaking. Heartbreaking story. Heartbreaking story. Yeah. So... She's back now in Aberdeen, and having res- resumed her maiden name, Catherine Knight didn't last long down on the farm with the folks. She soon moved out with the children to a rented proper- property in nearby Musselbrook. A year later, um, her back gave out due to constantly bending over a bony. Um, <laughs> and she had to give up work One day we'll go, but it's not this day. <laughs> Craig knew what he was doing. Yeah, he was, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Put my back out. <laughs> um, How'd you do that? He's bowning. Bloody bowning. Just bloody all the bloody bowning. <laughs> um, so she had to give up work altogether. The government found her a housing commission house in Aberdeen, which suited her because it was closer to the kids' school and they could walk instead of having to be driven every day. With a pensioner's income, all the, 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 uh, the thin... <laughs> I mean, the thing I read described her as attractive. I have not found an attractive photo of her. I'm just going to put it out there. Attractive uh, for the town of a thousand people that's only famous for a possibly, particular breed of bug. Possibly. I mean, she was tall and thin. I'll give them that. But that's. <laughs> but she's also. She looks. She looks like something you would brush something with, like, <laughs> you know, like a pipe cleaner. Um, <laughs> but now all she needed was a man. So after several unsuccessful relationships since the breakup with her husband, Catherine clicked with a man called Dave Saunders in the local hotel in 1986. Saunders was a 38-year-old miner, and he was right up Catherine Street. He's hard-working, hard-talking, hard-drinking man um, from a nearby town called Scone. Or Scone. <laughs> Scone. <laughs> Scone. Uh, and he was considered a good bloke. <laughs> Go on, Sophie. Good bloke. Down under, good bloke. He's a good bloke. Uh, He was so he was a miner, and he was also well known locally for being uh, a speedway driver. For all of uh, Catherine Knight's clandestine shortcomings, such as attacking people with knives, fists, and kitchen appliances, (laughs) that's one way. That's one way to describe it. (laughs) Clandestine shortcomings. (laughs) Yes, Your Honour. (laughs) Catherine also had a cheery and charming exterior, and the ruggedly handsome Saunders was smitten with her. The fact that she had a voracious sexual appetite was the icing on the cake. Um, Things went along lovingly for a few months. Dave Saunders kept his apartment at Scone and he moved in with Catherine and her two daughters along with his pet dingo. Ah, how very Australian. Fucking pet dingo. What even is a dingo? A dingo is a wild dog, right? It is a wild dog, yeah. It's like a, yeah, it's a... Something of the canid family that isn't that hasn't been domesticated for thousands of years. Like an Australian coyote kind of thing. It's like ah. when you see people walking foxes in the UK and you're like, what the fuck are you doing? It's a fox. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, it's, I thought you meant it's the dog the dog was called Dingo. No, it, kind of thing. It no, no it's, dingo. it's an actual fucking Dingo. Right? Yeah, an actual Dingo. It didn't take long for the green-eyed monster to come out in Catherine and she was constantly falsely accusing Saunders of having affairs with other women. Uh, I don't think Saunders was a womanizer either. So this is just, this is all Catherine. From then on, they were always at each other's throats and Catherine would throw him out the house, but no sooner uh, he arrived back at his place in Scone, she would be knocking on his door, begging for his forgiveness and asking to asking him to come back, which he always did. One night, he opened the door of the house to see Catherine doing the ironing. Without blinking in an eye, Catherine smashed him in the face with a hot iron and friends and neighbours, friends and neighbours said that you could see the steam marks on the side of his face oh, for a whole it's month after the incident. Shit. It sounds like something from Home Alone. Now. It's, just, it's just mad, isn't it? She was also oh. almost a foot taller than Saunders, and that night she swung him around the the room repeatedly, hitting him with the iron. Um, his only offence was he was slightly late home from work. Is that is that is like the Hannibal Lecter was? It doesn't like people who are rude. Yeah. She just doesn't like. She just likes people who are, aren't punctual. <laughs> she, being late, I think, is her biggest bugbear. Um, it is said that the reason both Dave stayed with Catherine Knight when asked later was because they both said 
she was fantastic in bed, and that's why, that's why they both stayed with her. I'm not that obsessed with sex that I'm not fearful for my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've never. I just don't get it. I don't get it. You've never care. experienced the danger, Sean. No, I must, yeah. You've I'm never experienced the boner. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Wrong twin. (laughs) (laughs) Never experienced the boner. It sounded quite threatening as well. I think Sophie is going to bum rape you with a strap. I know, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Can't experience the boner. (laughs) When we go back to the office, I'm always looking behind me in case there's just a rabid Sophie behind me with a strap on. Ready, a flick, <laughs> <laughs> Flicking in one hand, boning with the strap on in another. Oh, God. Oh, well, that is an image. <laughs> um, in, in May 1987, I'm only halfway through this. Uh, in May 1987, the two had a particularly brutal argument and Saunders had threatened to leave Catherine. So she hit him before running out of the house. Saunders <laughs> followed her. It sounds like such a chance. It's like... <laughs> gone. <laughs> Saunders ran out the house to follow her to find her nursing his two-month-old puppy, Dingo. <gasps> Catherine let him know what would happen to him if he ever played up with another woman by slitting the puppy's throat from ear to ear with her favourite boning knife. Later that night, she went round to her twin sister's joy house with a shotgun saying that she'd just killed Saunders. Catherine hadn't killed Saunders and later admitted that she did it just to get a rise out of her sister because she enjoyed the reaction she got from her. Fucking um, hell. She was also probably secretly rehearsing his death and seeing how people would react and seeing like who right. would turn her in or, or what would happen. But despite all of this and Catherine's continuing bizarre behaviour, which included a suicide attempt, Dave's pre uh, love proved unfailing and in June 1988, the following year, Kath gave birth Didn't, to their third child, a girl named thought, Sarah. I thought, I thought you were going to say they married. It's like, fucking hell, what's he nah, doing? He had another, another girl. Um, so with the arrival of a new baby, a calm settled over the little family of the mother, three girls, and the de facto father. So much so that Dave put a deposit on a tiny little house in Aberdeen, which Kath paid off in full when her workers' compensation came through in 1989. Remember? Oh, from, was that for her back? Yeah, for having her back put out from Bowney. Um, considering that outside of the children uh, the two tiny bedroomed weatherboard house on McQueen Street in Aberdeen was the first real possession that Catherine Knight had ever owned in her entire life it's hardly surprising that she decorated it in the way that she'd always dreamed of with her passion dead animals I thought you were going to say knives knives (laughs) everywhere (laughs) The, the walls were covered in cow hides water buffalo and steer horns old fashioned fur wraps cow and sheep skulls Deer's antlers. Um, prominently displayed was a stuffed peacock and a baby deer. Among other bric-a-brac adorning the walls and hanging from the rafters were a huge, huge wooden fork and spoon, rusted animal traps, leather coats, motorcycle dra- jackets, a rusted rake and a pitchfork, a riding boot, <laughs> boot and crop, and a saddle. Every single available space was filled up with old newspapers, clothes and books. Apparently, It was stinky. Apparently, as well, she also had an old fashioned lawnmower, you know, the push long ones, yeah. hanging from her ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> um, just she, just to spend a day in that head to think it's like, right, you know, it was like um, changing rooms or something like that. What you want here is that you want um, a lawnmower hanging here, a saddle draped over. You want to look good there, dead dingo. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Feng Shui, Sean. You want to read about it? Deal with it. <laughs> um, she also had a massively extensive video collection dealing predominantly with horror and death. Um, it was a museum of all of Catherine Knight's fantasies. There's no place like home. <laughs> um, but as blissful as it was in paradise with the new baby and the house filled with all of Catherine's favourite treasures. <laughs> Here's a few of my favourite things. <laughs> Predictably, it didn't last. In the new bout of exchanges, Kath battered Dave allegedly stabbed stabbed him with a pair of scissors Um, and when he returned to the love nest after a week in scone after a horrific fight he was invited in only to find that she'd cut up all of his clothes and taken them to this rubbish tip Um, 
I mean, with the house f so filled with knives, why is she using scissors? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Just, just each, she probably just twizzled them around the living room, and they all got That's shredded true. up, didn't she? Uh, this time, Dave decided he'd had enough, and he took his long service leave from the mines, gave up, gave all of his old drinking haunts a miss. And despite Ka Catherine's uh, frantic efforts to find him, she had absolutely no luck. He clued up his mates to tell him exactly where he was, but none of them would give her any information. Fantastic. Um, he'd ran off to Newcastle, taken up another job, and laid low to escape his 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 girlfriend. I'm going to assume this isn't Newcastle, the northeast no, of England. It's Newcastle, it's New <laughs> and this is where this is this is the, the amazing link between the two types of Craig stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, months later, Dave did return to Mc to his home in McQueen Street to see his daughter, only to find that in his absence, Kath had gone to the local police and told them that she was terrified that he would return oh, and bash her. Um, so the so the police um, issued an apprehended violence order against him to legally keep him away from her and the kids. Because oh, <laughs> I imagine it's going to be like in America and Britain of a similar time where the the separate um, constituent you know, constituent constabularies <laughs> they're, not, they're not communicating with each other about what she'd done previously yeah but... they won't have any record of her she's she's just a woman who's come in well, remember, saying she's never had any charges I'm, I'm pressed her. against her right the, the, the so they wouldn't even, even, yeah, yeah there wouldn't even be a record oh, yeah. yeah um it didn't take uh catherine knight long to find another lover and a few months into the relationship she was pregnant the father was a local knockabout, John Chillingworth, 43, who worked at the Aberdeen Meatworks, and the baby, a boy named Eric, was born in 1991. Catherine left John pretty quickly, and she left him with all of her kids as well. Uh, <laughs> which I think is actually a saving grace, because apparently John was a bit of a drunk and a bit of a layabout, and he completely changed his ways um, and brought the kids up really well. So oh, fantastic. So there's, a, that, there's, a, there's, a, there's a glimmer of light in this story. Fantastic. Yeah, so that was a bit of a saving grace for her children. So now we move on to Pricey, which was sadly Catherine Knight's um, victim. So her erratic on and off again style saw that the relationship only lasted three years with um, John Chillingworth. Uh, the locals were amazed that it even lasted that, that long. And it ended acrimoniously when Catherine Knight jumped, dumped Chillingworth for John Price, an Aberdeen local she'd been having an affair with behind his back. Although he was distraught at the time, uh, it turned out that he was the luckiest bloke on the planet. He overcome his broken heart, got off the booze, and did something constructive with his life. That play. Um, meanwhile, John Price, who'd taken up his uh, taken up with the Wicked Witch of Aberdeen, had literally signed his own death warrant. It's as if the violence and suffering that she inflicted on all the men before John Pricey Price were just the warm-up acts to, and the absolutely horrific violence he would re, he would receive from her would be her, her crowning glory. From all accounts, Pricey was a terrific bloke and he'd give you his left arm if you needed it and he was liked by everyone who knew him. He'd been married before and he had three kids when the marriage broke up in 1988. His wife took the youngest, a two-year-old girl, when she left and he ended up with a teenage boy and a girl to look after. He owned a nice three-bedroomed brick bungalow on St Andrew's Street in Aberdeen, and he brought home a good salary from working in the local mine. So the family wanted for nothing, and he was a good, stable guy. Um, he was also a bit of a drinker, and but just like a regular nice bloke. You all right, Sophie? Am I boring you? No, I was just listening to it. She looked bored to tears. <laughs> That's just how my face looks. Um, resting, resting board face is that what it is <laughs> <laughs> I think you're saying it wrong um, <laughs> so Pricey met Catherine at a local hotel she seems to meet all of her men at a local hotel I don't know if it's that where if they, they have, must have like, like, open yeah, bars or something and dance nights or something like that yeah uh, he was 38 and they were the same age <laughs> dance nights <laughs> yeah, just, you're making yourself sound well old <laughs> just, well this was 1993 so I'd have been 11 <laughs> and and in, and in fact, dance was the scene as well. Wasn't it? <laughs> was it? Oh, I'm not nice. sure if it was in rural Australia. But... What the population? The town of Aberdeen with a population of thousand, yeah. thousand of you. Um, he went into that relationship with his eyes wide open. They were both thirty eight, and he'd heard all of the rumours about the way she treated her men, but he chose to ignore them. 
Uh, the relationship started out the same as all of her previous liaisons with the devoted loving spouse who cooked and sewed and picked a man up and drove him home from the hotel when he couldn't walk drunk. And she was absolutely dynamite in the sack. His kids got along famously with her children and life was a bunch of roses. But it didn't take long for the cracks to show accusations of infidelity, fights, separations and the inevitable getting back together. I'm assuming the accusations of infidelity were to her him. about him. Yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, they met in 93. By late 1995, uh, Catherine had moved in with Pricey at, at his family home in St. Andrew Street. Um, to her, it must have seemed like living in Buckingham Palace after a cramped little, little doom cottage that she lived in with all the dead animals on the walls. Um, but the pair would drink heavily together and the drinking escalated. And as the drinking escalated, so did the fighting. Uh, they could be regularly seen at each other's throats in the street outside their front door <laughs> um, or outside of any of the local hotels where they drank. It was all fun and games one minute and giving each other a gobful and a back eye the next. Pricey's nickname for Catherine was the Little Speckled Hen and it wasn't long before the Little Speckled Hen was pushing for some more lifelong commitment from Price. Uh, Pricey told her that there was no chance and he was only in it for the hot sex. <laughs> I'm sure she took that calmly and you know cal you know and just moved up, got on with it yeah I'm sure yeah. that was the case yeah. let's see how she took it Sean she started by telling Pricey's 14 year old daughter that she wasn't actually his and then that her mother was just a whore who slept around <gasps> Jesus Christ ouch she then went searching his house while he was out and found his will and she was even more furious to find out that he'd left everything to his ex-wife and kids um She's... Why did she think she, she, you know, you've been in his life a year and a half, maybe two years. Why did you think these, you know, he said no to any form of commitment. He's, you know, why would you think he would put you in his will? <laughs> well, hell has no fury. It's like, delusion, isn't it? I know, yeah. You know, that, that psychopathic delusion. Isn't it? Mm. She, uh, she demanded $10,000 to leave. He refused to give her anything at all, so she got herself a video recorder and filmed all of the first aid kits that Pricey had been stealing from the mine. Um, in 1998, Catherine showed Pricey's boss at the mines the videotape, as well as sending a copy to the police. Catherine maintained that she recorded the tape as a revenge over a fight about his ongoing refusal to marry her. They'd come to blows and he had belted her. Um, she'd planned on showing the tape to Pricey to use as blackmail against him. But after another horrendous fight, she decided to go one step th further and show it to his employers. This is her take on it. Yeah. I don't, I don't so even nothing think says marry. Yeah, nothing says marry me like a bit of blackmail. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, as well, these were first aid kits that were past their use by date and had been put in the bin. Um, and he'd be right. like, "I'm going to take them all." Um, but it was still enough to get him sacked from the job that he'd loved for 17 years. Mm. Uh, Sad. So the same day he booted out that he got sacked, he booted her out of the home and she fled back to her tiny chamber of horrors in McQueen Street. And the story of wasn't, her... Wasn't her, her fellow living there? Did the previous fellow live in there? Uh, no, he, he, no, he was living in his own house now, I think. And oh, right, okay. Put himself. The story of her viciousness spread around the town um, like a bushfire and given a track record, it didn't surprise anyone at all. When Pricey took Catherine back a few months later, he didn't move, even though he didn't move her back into his house, he lost a lot of friends who were like, what are you doing, mate? She's an absolute nut job. Um, and when, at that time, Catherine was told her, her other daughter, Natasha, it was like, this time we're going to be together until death. Oh. <laughs> it's creepy as fuck, isn't it? Um, their fights resumed with renewed venom they would get drunk and argue over her now getting him the sack from the mine and then for everyone to see um you know they it was just weird it was like they couldn't live with each other but they couldn't live without each other and something was going to give it wasn't long before kath had free reign of re, free reign of pricey's house again but it didn't help matters in the least the arguments escalated in violence and after a series of assaults which included Catherine stabbing him in the chest with a knife during the argument in the kitchen. Um, John Price was at this point absolutely just desperate to get rid of her like the last one and the one before. Um, the last few days of John's life were building into a grisly climax. 
On the Sunday before his death, the couple had a massive fight which culminated in a visit from the police. On the So that was on the Sunday. On the Monday, Pricey showed two colleagues at work where she'd previously stabbed him. Um, and then on the Tuesday, he went to Scone Magistrates Court and took out an apprehended violence order against Catherine Knight to keep her away from his house and hopefully out of his life once and for all. Pricey was told that he'd need to wait three weeks before he could go to court. He had no idea that he was always already halfway through the last day of his life. So the mm. morning he was, he took a day off work to get this apprehended violence order against her. And she killed him that, that later that day. Workmates pleaded with John not to go home that night. But he said if he's going to, if she's going to get anyone, he'd rather it was him and then, and not the kids. And so he went home. While Pricey... Do you reckon that she would have... But I was going to say, she would never hurt a child, but then... She would definitely we, hurt we, a child. She put her own child on a train track. Yeah. And then she killed that dog in... No, Dingo in... Uh, she killed that Dingo in front of... Yeah. Um, the, the fella, I can't remember his name. She cut um, it. Yeah, she cut yeah, it yeah, from ear to ear. She'd do anything. She could... Uh, she, I think what she is capable of is... She could do anything. Uh, it's mind-bending how violent she is. Um, so while Pricey was at the courts, Catherine had been out and she'd bought herself a sexy black nighty. Uh, and she'd went later. She'd in an, in a separate event. She went over to her daughter's Natasha's house to record a family video. Not in the not in the sexy black <laughs> in the in the nighty in uh, the nighty. In the video, she can be seen kissing her kids and saying things that could be perceived to be her last will and testament. John Price went home to an empty house and was in bed by 11 p.m. after visiting his neighbours when a vehicle pulled into his driveway and Kath entered the house. She watched TV for a few minutes, had a shower before joining Pricey in bed wearing her sexy uh, her sexy new black nighty. The pair had sex, then she struck. The police were alerted the next morning. Pricey was normally one of the first to work and so his colleagues, knowing of all of the strife that was happening, uh, called them early when he didn't turn up for work. The police tried ringing the house repeatedly but there was no answers. Police officers made the following report at the house the next day. About 6 a.m. on Wednesday, Wednesday, March 1st, a neighbour noticed the victim's John Price's uh, the victim's work utility truck was still at his home. This appeared unusual as the victim had normally left for work. Uh, the neighbour came became concerned, as did the employer of the victim, who was by this time making inquiries as to why the victim had not attended work. Attempts were made by the neighbour and another friend to wake the victim by knocking on the bedroom window. The neighbour and friend then went to the front door. They saw a small amount of blood on the wooden exterior. Police were contacted and attended around 8am. The police at the scene forced entry to the house through the rear door. Upon entry, the, the police located the victim's exterior layers of skin hanging from a hook in a doorway arch into the lounge room. They then located the victim's decapitated remains on the lounge floor near a small foyer leading to the front door. A further search of the house by police resulting in, the, in them locating Catherine Knight, who was snoring loudly in a comatose condition on a double bed at the end of the house. She was removed from the house immediately by police and later conveyed to a hospital by ambulance. Um, she was? She was, yeah. She'd, she'd taken a few pills and gone to uh, sleep. Oh, right. right. That's why she's so um, dozy and sleep. Comatose, yeah. Right. So he'd predicted his own his own death all of his neighbors had predicted exactly what had happened because they phoned as soon as he didn't go to work it's like yeah. all of the neighbors and friends were watching it's creepy isn't it because um they're both it feels like that they both both Catherine and what did you say his name was sorry david. pricey david pricey. price yeah yeah david um if it seemed like they both knew what was going to happen both like had sex and just kind of, I don't know, just like let it happen. It was yeah, they both seemed, not let it happen. That she knew she was going to do it, um, and was going to get caught for it. And he seemed fully aware that someone is going to die. It and he almost yeah. sacrificed himself. And that's, yeah. that's, it's it's like predestiny, isn't it? It's like this is was always going to happen. Kind as long of as it's, it's like it felt like he was a good expected. dad as well. It's, it's maybe it was like. You know, as long as it's not my girls. Yeah. 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 Um, it makes it extra haunting. Yeah. So, I, in, shortly, I will read um, 
the police's first hand evidence from the murder scene which is particularly haunting so just a bit of a warning before that uh before that arrives so so he predicted his, his own death all of his neighbors knew it was going to happen or or he'd been telling his neighbors he'd he'd even ran around trying to get help uh, and solicit help from the courts and the police but to no avail Catherine, on the other hand, she'd had sex with him one last time before deciding that if she couldn't have him, nobody could. Uh, she'd murdered him in cold blood, butchered and ate parts of him, then took a load of sleeping pills. The following account is the complete report by crime scene investigator, detective senior constable Peter Anthony Muschio, who was at the first... Sorry, Chris. Sorry, did, um, did you... Is it disputed one way or the other way she tried to kill herself or she was trying to get to sleep? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there are she did take various pills, which are in this report. Right. Um, but um, so I don't know. I think she probably was trying to kill herself. Uh, but it's, it's just yeah. So yeah, warning. Uh, this is going to be pretty grim. So it's the uh, complete report by the crime scene investigator. Uh, Constable Peter Anthony Muschio, who was the first officer into the premises after the initial discovery of his body. In cases such as this, it's his job to piece together the, the macabre facts of, in a first-hand account from the evidence of the murder scene before any, anyone else touches a thing. Uh, there is a video of this gathering of evidence as well, but it's closed. Um, so there are people who have seen it that describe it, and it's meant to be absolutely harrowing. So this is the description. About 10 a.m. Wednesday the 1st of March, in the company with Detective Sergeant Neil Raymond, I attended the premises of 84 St. Andrew Street, Aberdeen, in relation to an alleged homicide. There I spoke to a number of police, including duty officer Graham Furlonger, Detective Bob Wells, and Senior Constable Michael Prentice. The premises is a single-story, three-bedroom dwelling which faces south onto St. Andrew Street. The premise was built towards the eastern side of the block, leaving a grassed area to the western side, and three vehicles were parked. These vehicles were a white Toyota, a Ford sedan, and a, and a white Toyota Land Cruiser. Uh, there were galvanized steel garn sheds in the rear yard, one at each corner. There's also a brick barbecue. The dwelling had a full-length veranda across the southern side and a smaller veranda to the, cent to the rear of the premises. My attention was drawn to a piece of cooked meat, in the mm. cooked meat on the rear lawn in front of the white Ford sedan. I made an examination of this piece of meat and collected it for further testing. During my examination, I took a series of photographs from the premises and a cooked uh, and another piece of cooked meat on the lawn. I entered the premises to con conduct a cursory examination with Detective Sergeant Ray Raymond. I walked in through the rear door and into the kitchen. Once inside the kitchen, I saw a large section of what appeared to be human skin hanging from the top architrave of the doorway leading to the lounge room. This piece of skin extended from the top doorway right to the floor and appeared to be an entire human skin. Looking through the doorway into the lounge room, I could see a headless and skinless human body. I walked east along the hallway and looked into the entry foyer and saw an extreme amount of blood pooled on the floor. There was also a large amount of blood smearing over the eastern wall of the entry. I walked further east along the hallway and noticed some, some blood staining leading from the main bedroom. In this bedroom, I noticed more blood staining, however, only moderate amounts. I then left the scene and had a discussion with Sergeant Raymond and other investigating police outside the scene. I then re-entered the premise and made a more detailed examination. The rear door of the premise opens to the laundry off the western side of this is the kitchen dining room. The laundry contained a stainless steel uh, tub in the northeast corner and a washing machine further south along the eastern wall. There was a built-in cupboard in two separate wooden louvered doors in the southern wall of the laundry. On the western wall of the laundry was a cavity sliding door that gave access to the dining room and kitchen. The room was divided into two sections, with the kitchen being in the western end and the dining room being in the eastern end. The dining room contained a wood and steel table, of which three matching seats placed around it. There were items of clothing, clothing draped over the backs of each of the three chairs. On the dining room table was a tool bag, some clothing, a small blue folder, an electronic toy, a gorilla and some prescription medicine boxes. So I'm just going to break from this. She set up three places at the dining room table. Um, I noticed blood staining in the, on the shoulder area of a blue shirt, which was draped over the chair on the western side of the table. The medication on the table consisted of three boxes of some tablets, two of which were empty. The medication normally contains two strips, each containing 15 tablets. However, only one full strip containing 15 tablets remained. 
There was also one empty box of another type of tablets. Uh, and normally contains 90 tablets. The fourth chair the fourth chair of the set was against the northern wall under a bench portion of the breakfast bar. I took a series of photos of the dining room. Uh, the kitchen in the east portion of the room consisted of a kitchen bench with overhead cupboards along an eastern wall. About central to this bench was an electric cooktop which had a baking dish and an aluminium boiler on it. Along the southern wall was a was a wall oven and further east were two built-in pantry and freestanding fridges. Along the northern wall was another bench with an incorporated sink and further east was a breakfast bar that protruded from the northern wall into the kitchen and divided the kitchen and dining room. As I mentioned earlier, I saw what appeared to be a complete human skin or pelt hanging from the top of the architrave door separating the dining room and lounge room. On closer examination, I could distinguish black curly hair at the top. Oh, Christ. A nose and part of the mouth and ear. About halfway down the pelt, I could see a clump of short black curly hair consistent with pubic hair. I could not recognize any other particular features as I continued to the floor. The edges of the pelt were incised, indicating to me that it had been removed with a sharp instrument. There were also a number of distinct stab wounds to the pelt about a meter down from the top. The pelt was attached to the architrave by a stainless steel meat hook. The hook was pierced through the top of the head area and the pelt and then hooked over the architrave on the da- on the lounge room side of the door. The, sp- the skin appeared to have to vary in thickness between one and four centimetres. I noticed a blood trail leading from the lounge room into the kitchen towards the kitchen cooktop of the vicinity of the aluminium boiler. The boiler was on the right side rear element, which at the time was turned off. When I lifted the lid to the boiler, I noticed it was warm to touch. The pot was full of liquid and on the surface I could identify a, identify a skinned human head and a number of cooked vegetables. On the northern side of the aluminium boiler I saw a baking dish which was sitting across the right front side of the element. Inside the baking dish I saw an amount of liquid and the remains of baked vegetables. Just to the right of the northern side of the cooktop I saw two prepared meals. Each of the meals consisted of two pieces of cooked meat baked potatoes, baked pumpkin, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash and gravy. Underneath each of the meals was a torn section of kitchen paper with a name written on it. The name, the word Beaky was written in blue ink on one of the pieces, while the word Jonathan was, was on the other. The pieces of meat appeared on the plates were similar to the piece that I collected from the real lawn. Beaky and Jonathan were the names of his, the, his nicknames that he gave his children. Shit me. On the section, she had so yeah, three kids, two girls and a boy. On the section of the kitchen bench across the northern wall were a number of items of interest. On the western end of the bench, I saw a green electric jug with blood staining about the handle. In the sink, I saw an orange-coloured vegetable peeler and vegetable peelings from the, the from the potato, pumpkin, and zucchini and onion. On the eastern side of the sink, I saw a cream-coloured microwave dish containing cooked cabbage leaves, leaves in liquid. In the front of the microwave dish, I saw a brown-coloured coffee cup that was sitting on a wooden cup cutting up board inside the coffee cup was a teaspoon and a small quantity of thick brown liquid similar to gravy um <clears throat> just to the right of the cutting board was a yellow handled uh, knife and two forks the the handle of the knife was blood stained it's like she's just gone about making a sunday dinner yeah with him yeah. um do you reckon that was shock or it's just kind of like fuck knows full, 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 in, full intent it's like she doesn't know what she's done but it's like right got get and then the kids are coming around tomorrow or something like that and then she's just gone into oh my pilot or do you reckon she was always gonna she part of the, all this behavior has been you know she's wanted to eat somebody I, I have no idea so so there's more but so there's more there's more drugs lying around and um, there's you know uh Beer stubby, packets of cigarettes, and more empty pill boxes. Um, was this the, there was a bloodstained bare footprints around the kitchen, um, and blood staining on the fridge and the door handles, blood staining around the breakfast bar, uh, as if somebody had been opening and closing the door with bloodied hands. Uh, there were smears on across the fridge and lower down straining from droplets of blood that had come into contact with the surface um 
Okay, so the skinless and headless body of a person known to me as John Charles Price was was in a supine position with his legs protruding into the entry foyer from knees down. I think supine position means sat up. I believe so. Uh, there was a substantial amount of blood smeared over the carpet around the body. As mentioned earlier, there was also an extreme amount of blood pooling on the floor of the entry foyer. In this blood pool and staining were marks where, where the body of the deceased had been dragged about one metre from the middle of the entry foyer onto the carpet in the lounge room. The deceased was laying on his back with his legs crossed at the feet. The left ankle was on top of the right. His left arm was extending out from the body at an, exam at an angle of around 45 degrees. Under the left wrist of his arm was an empty plastic 1.25 litre Shelley's Club lemon squash bottle. The right arm was also extended lying alongside the body. On the floor adjacent to the right arm was a blood-stained 31 centimetre yellow plastic handled knife. The blade of the knife was 17.5 centimetres long. The body was devoid of skin and flesh, exposing muscles and some organs. There were a number of runes present on the body, one of the most obvious being a stab wound to the left side of the chest, which extended into the chest cavity. As stated, the body had been skinned in a manner that leads me to believe that the person responsible would have had significant skill in this area. From the blood staining on the carpet, I was able to determine that the deceased had been skinned prior to decapitation. There was a definite outline of the head in the blood staining on the carpet. Examination of the neck region of the deceased indicated that the head had been removed very carefully and cleanly with a sharp instrument. On the seat of the single lounge chair in the northeast corner of the room was a black-handled honing steel, which is a sharpening stone, and an open packet of Winfield blue cigarettes. She sat there, smoking, sharpening her knife, uh, just looking at him. Yeah. Um, I also noticed bloody handprints on the back and the arms of the chair. On the northern wall of the western side of the wall was a small display cabinet. Lying on this cabinet was a broken picture frame containing a picture of the deceased, Lying on top of the picture frame was a blood-stained watch. To the west of the photograph, still on top of the cabinet, was a blood-stained blood handwritten note together with a broken picture, with another broken picture on top of it. Uh, it also had small pieces of flesh resting on it. The note on top was poorly written and contained very basic, basic spelling mistakes. It read, Time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. You... You to Beck for Ross for Little John. Uh, now play with Little John's dick, John Price. Um, so it's just like ram mad ramblings, but obviously a, a rape. Um, Jonathan um, was his son. And yeah. she's accusing Jonathan of raping her daughter. But the allegations are completely baseless. So, what I know it's quite a detailed report and uh, quite long winded, but basically, his final th statement sort of sums up what had happened. Um, it's like, and so he, he gives it like a final one paragraph statement on what he thought happened in just his non official words. But he says, I remember walking down the hallway, and at about short, shoulder height, there were all these blood spatter marks on the wall. To me, it's indicative of each attack. He has been absolutely fighting for his life. <laughs> this is really Australian. The bloke's just had a bonk in the bed, and then when he wakes up, then stab, stab, stab. He's getting up. There's arterial spurting on the robe and on the bed and on the doorway, and there's a bloodied handprint or swipe on the western side of the door near the dressing table. Blood's all around the white switch. It looks like he's tried to turn the light switch on, and then all the way down the hallway, there are bloody handprints everywhere. He's almost made it. He almost fr opened the front door. The screen door's still shut and there's blood staining trajectory again all over the screen door. Flicking out across the front door. He almost made it, but he would never have survived. He would have been absolutely horrified, terrified, uh, trying to get out, the t get out and all of the time being stabbed. So he's literally, she stabbed him in the bedroom. And then she's just been stabbing him down the hallway as he's trying to get up, trying to get right. away. Then he's she's dragged him back in. Then she's cut, she's skinned him, cut him up, and cooked him. It's just we, and, mad. And then to to feed him to yeah. his kid. Yeah, I mean, luckily, obviously, the kid's never 
saw any of so, it. So how what, how did the cooked meat get out on the lawn? Uh, I don't just know. Throw, just throw it away? No idea. But in the autopsy revealed that after the victim was dead, he was skinned. A razor, knife, razor sharp knife had been inserted just below his collarbone and sliced horizontally across the top of the body from shoulder to shoulder, right under the clavicles. It was it was a straight, clean cut, almost anatomically precise cut. Then the knife was turned and the cut down the chest over the stomach and pubic line to the made with a T with another perfectly straight line. She has boned him like a professional. Yeah. Literally, she skinned him. She cut him from shoulder to shoulder, then down to his pubis perfectly. And, and then peeled his skin off him. It's just mad, isn't it? Um, she it's didn't... Just the, his description of the hair, just like, oh, Christ. And it's like, how do you... As, just as a human being, how do you see that and come back from that? You know, just as a, you know... Oh, man. The... Uh, the, so the the documentary I watched, one of the um, one of the detectives says, "I've been receiving twenty years of PTSD retreatment." It's like twenty it. years, and he says, "And I'm still." He says, "I'll never be over it." So she she did that. She cut the T, and then she cut. She was very careful not to cut his penis or genitals. Then she cut she cut gently down both of his thighs, over his knees, and to his feet. She then moved the body, held his arms up, and cut down the back of each one and across the top of the victim's head, then peeled him off perfectly, his head, his hair, his face, and all the way down the length of the body. Um, the entire skin was in one perfect piece, including hair, face, ears, nose, mouth, genitals, complete with the stab holes that she'd, she'd made whilst killing him. It's just crazy, isn't it? She's mm, absolutely brutal. Absolutely the uh, brutal. the forensic this is someone pathologist. Someone she said she loved, right? This is this is love, right? The, the, well, the forensic the forensic pathologist said the whole procedure would have taken her about forty minutes. Is so, that all? Yeah. <coughs> it's 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 just insane. So it's just, it's just when you you know so he's his skin's not hanging and then she's going about nonchalantly cooking the tea she she it's just yeah she cooked his ass cheek basically it was pieces of his ass that she cooked it's just um, absolutely... it just shows right she spent her life um killing animals professionally and having like disregard for their pain and their life and just seeing them as food and it just shows that she didn't view human life in, in like any different, different way. Yeah. If anything, I think she would probably would have done it earlier if she didn't work in the slaughterhouse. That probably sated her bloodlust for a long time. Do you reckon it only kind of started when she was had to retire? Well, uh, she was violent before that, but... But not murderous. Not murderous, yeah. Until she put her back out and born in. Um... So she went, the, she had taken an overdose, but she was fine. And then they took her um, into intensive questioning. Despite this, she, she denied having any recollection of what happened that night. Um, she was charged with his murder at, the, uh, at a bedside in the hospital psychiatric wing. Um, in a bizarre twist, she'd actually gone out that night after killing him and withdrawn a thousand dollars from John Price's bank account from an ATM. So she went out and came back, then did all this. Or John did all, Price. Uh, was it Yeah, John Price. I thought it was Dave. The other two Dave. the other two the previous were two were David's. Yeah. David oh, Keller and David Saunders. The yeah. This one's surprisingly easy this week. It's Dave Dave John. <laughs> right, Dave. And then the John. the other guy in between. Um, so, so was she? So, so she went out covered in blood to a cash machine. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. She's she, but she drew that night. She drew a thousand dollars out of his account. Uh, so she was sentenced. She's the first woman in Australia to be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Uh, the judge said to her, 
uh, that that the papers, the police papers, mark never to be released. Um, see, she since appealed the the severity of the sentence. Um, on what grounds? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> on what possible grounds? I know. Yeah. So it's open to debate as to whether or not Kath Knight ate parts of her lover after she definitely sliced and cooked pieces of his head, cheeks, and buttocks. It was hard to say if all of the pieces of John Price were accounted for. To this day, she maintains that she that all she recalls of the night is that they had good sex and they both climaxed. Um, then Jesus Christ. the fact that you, the fact that you you can't you can't turn around and say you didn't eat someone if you can't remember what did happen. Yeah. Uh, so. the. the <laughs> The general consensus of opinion is that she did eat part of him, and then she's blocked it out because it was it was abhorrent to her. Yeah. Uh, so she's still alive now. She's in Malawa, Malawa Women's Correctional Center, and she works as a cleaner in the governor's office. She's now age sixty-five, and she's a very good cook. But it's highly unlikely she'll ever get a job in the kitchen. Hmm. Uh, I bet. I bet. It's crazy. She's only sixty-five. That sounds really yeah. young for me. I know, yeah. yeah. I spent I spent some much older than but then you were talking about, you know, this 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 happened what, ninety six, ninety seven? Yeah. Yeah. And she was she was thirty they were thirty eight when they met. So they were yeah. like thirty eight or thirty nine. They were like my age when they met. That's crazy. Um so yeah, that's it. The story of Catherine Knight and we have some pictures. Great yeah, story. So... Great, great story, Craig. It's it's just a very grim story. It is grim. Very grim. So now for our YouTube and Twitch followers, we'll be showing you some pictures. Um, if you listen on one of the audio channels, just go over to our Instagram and I will upload the photos that we go through. So we are at DetectivePod. Follow us as well. So Catherine Knight, text me when you get home podcast. Hold on. Okay. So this is Catherine Knight. Um, That face isn't the person that I had in mind when you were telling us about all this at all. No, and I think a lot of when you when you watch the documentary, a lot of the detectives are like, you could walk past this woman in the street and not think twice. Like you wouldn't think she's She's capable. She looks like an extra in like this is England or something. She does, doesn't she? Looks like whenever I see a picture of somebody from that time period, from like the seventies or eighties. This is the People 90s. Their... Oh, well, 90s. <laughs> but specifically, I'm thinking about the 80s, though. Um, people in their, like, 20s and 30s look like granddads from the get-go. Like, she yeah. doesn't look like she's your age there. She looks like she's in her 50s, like a nana. Yeah. yeah. Don't she? With her, she... like, her tinted, tinted glasses, her, like, permed hair. Woody cheeks. She was yeah. a grandmother when she committed this. So her eldest daughter had kids when she committed this. Right. So. Right. Well, and when I say Nana, I mean of Nana. Typical yeah. Nana age. Yeah, like 60, 70-year-old Nana. Yeah. So this is uh, Dave Shorty Kellett. This is her first love. I'm so, still not seeing the attractive bombshell. No. Uh, no. That, sh- that shirt, though, my word. Yeah. That, that's of the has- time. So this is funky top on. This is seventies, isn't it? So she was. Um, yeah. When these two 18. got together, he was twenty-two and she was eighteen. Oh. <laughs> this, oh, this is, is the ceiling, the rake in the hoe in the. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Look at this. I imagine at this point the lawnmower's fallen down. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there are various other pictures, but yeah, there there are. Some are just like a magpie and a, and a dead fox. It's just weird. The place is weird. So this is Dave Price. Uh, right, this is so a, a I thought it was John Price. Uh, sorry, John Price. <laughs> this is John Price. John Price. It's because there's too many Daves. I got myself confused. So, yeah, this is, it's a picture of John and um, Catherine together just out. Out she is she having a cigarette? Yeah, yeah. drinking probably because that's what they did together. She's wearing a C and A hat that dates it, doesn't it? Look at that. Yeah. yeah. Even then, she just did you say she was in her late thirties when this happened? She was yeah. in her late thirties when they met. 
Um, she's probably forty odd, early forties. Yeah, they yeah, met in nineteen. She looks in a... She's probably she forty one at the latest. At the at the latest, there. She looks like an old old woman. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but she just looks like she's had a hard life. Yeah. Well, he killed her in. They met in nineteen ninety five. Um. Right, no. So 1993, they when they they met when they they were 38, both of them, and she killed him in 2000. So she's somewhere between 38 45. and 45 in that picture. Yeah. Um, this is the hallway, and this is literally him trying to escape. Awful. Um. Say what we've done in the last few episodes. We've done well to find grim photos. Well done, us. Oh, there's definitely worse. This is this is mild. Oh, yeah. This Christ, is, is that her? This is a recent picture of her. Doesn't look like her. Doesn't look like it. Looks like she's been swapped by someone else. <laughs> Just pretending to be Catherine Knight. Yeah. So she's sixty-five in that picture. She looks well older than that, doesn't she? I don't feel like that's her. I think that's someone else. Yeah. No, it's definitely her. There's another picture of her peering through like the metals just lot in a in a cell. I just the bridge of her nose uh, is completely different. I don't believe it's her. I think <laughs> I think she's got something wrong with her face. Like if you look at it, it looks like it looks like a growth at the t- at the bridge of her nose. All right, maybe. That's yeah. it? Yeah. She's brutal, isn't she? Yeah. 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 So she's, ir- she's an irredeemable woman. There's no, I don't think there's any positive thing that you could say about her. I mean you start yeah. she starts out battering her sister, taking on men on the boning floor. It's just like she's just as mad as a box of frogs, isn't she? Yeah. Truly evil. Mm. So that's it for today. We hope you enjoyed the story, even, <laughs> <laughs> even though it was one of Craig's st- finest. So we do stretch the word enjoy to its limit, don't we, on this show? You can enjoy a grim story. Okay. Like, it wasn't fun, but, <laughs> but it was uh, interesting. Uh, all that's left to say is remember, be safe and text me when you get home. Bye. Bye. Bye.